welcome to the journal of the Oxford Graduate Theological Society YouTube page. My name is Natasha Chola and I'm the editor of the journal. I'm joined today by two other members of the editorial board, Dallas Calloway and Mimi Nicholson on tech. Professor Williams is a noted theologian, a poet and a fellow of both the British Academy and the Royal Society of Literature. He has lived a life of utmost hope, educating, inspiring and uplifting people from many backgrounds along the way. We can't think of anyone better to speak about hope and time in theology and religion. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Professor Williams. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you for the invitation. So, uh, the first question is actually, uh, is really three questions. Um, first, how would you describe hope? And second, how would you describe hope in the relationship between the temporal and the eternal? And then third, what is the theological, theological significance of this? Hope, I suppose, could be defined as a kind of confidence, not, um, not a prediction that everything is going to turn out all right, which is optimism, but a confidence that whatever turns out, there is a resource that enables you to stay alive, intelligent, and grounded. So I begin with that, that if we're talking about what nourishes hope, we have to ask what nourishes confidence. And theologically speaking, of course, we say the ground for confidence is not in ourselves, what we can achieve, what we can get on top of, or we can organize. Our confidence lies in the belief, certainly in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that the world exists because God desires that it exists. We exist because God desires that we exist. And God's desire is expressed in faithfulness to the world that God has made and God's faithfulness to, to us as, as a human family. We may do all kinds of things to wreck, and injure and frustrate that purpose and that desire, but because it's God's purpose and God's desire, the fact of it doesn't alter. So that's our ground for hope. And that means that hope in relation to the passage of time is something to do with the fact that we are able both to look forward with confidence and to look back and say, rather as in the scriptural narratives, here and here and here, we see what it might mean for God to be discovered to be faithful, for God to be discovered to be the one who doesn't go away in crisis or disaster. So the telling of the story is a very important part of the ground of hope as well. In what ways can the church, situated in this world and in this time, act in the service of hope? The church doesn't exist, of course, to, to solve problems. One of the great misunderstandings people have about the church inside and outside is as if the church were a kind of slot machine where you went with your problems and out came answers. The church is there to point to precisely that unalterable fact of the divine commitment. And if I had to define what really grounded the integrity of the church, and for that matter, the integrity of the Jewish people likewise, I would say it's that this community has its rationale in standing as witness to the commitment of God, the God who doesn't go away. So how does the church express this? Certainly not in terms of anxiously flicking through a catalogue of strategies. It has to strategize, it has to think about priorities and resources. But its primary job is to say, this is why we are confident in getting up in the morning, that God remains God. That for the, for the Christian, the God who has shown the divine consistency in and through the death and resurrection of Jesus is a God who has demonstrated that this God is worth believing in because this is a God who does not abandon. So we tell that story. We tell it in the sacraments of the church. We tell it in the reading of the Bible and the exposition of the Bible. And of course, we tell it in the lives of human beings. And I would say that one of the tasks the church always has is to find the narratives of human life that exemplify hope. I, I once said that we, we in the church like to tell the stories of the saints, and we think of St. Francis and St. Teresa and all the rest of it. And we ought perhaps to have a rather more local 
view that every parish ought to have, if you like, a little repertoire of stories it would like to tell, not about St. Francis and St. Teresa, but about um, St. Darren and St. Gladys and you know, the, the local people who have, who have lived out lives of fidelity and, and trust and confidence and shown us that it can be done. And the other thing in which I think the church can show this is, is the church locally and globally a community that is visibly faithful to the environment in which it lives? Does it show commitment itself to the need and the struggle of those immediately around? And that can be the church's willingness to, let's say, to advocate on behalf of the Uyghur community in China, or it can be the church's willingness to host the food bank in the local church hall. But you know, between those poles, there are many varieties of action by which the church demonstrates that it is dependably there for those who need assurance, who need to know that their humanity is treasured and valued. Um, what can we learn from scriptural and religious texts regarding time, um, timelessness, temporality, and eternity? It's a very large question thinking about time and eternity for rather obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say, first of all, that the scriptural narrative suggests to us that what we learn of God, we learn as time-taking beings. We grow in time, we move in time. And even if God really wanted to, God couldn't just tell us everything about the divine nature in one go. We would still have to learn. So that's why it's important that scripture, um, Hebrew scripture and Christian scripture alike, are stories of learning. Jesus draws around himself disciples, and disciples are literally learners. Mm -hmm. It's not that Jesus calls Peter and James and John at the Sea of Galilee and hands over the Nicene Creed to them. They have to spend time with him, and in his life and his death and his resurrection, they learn. So that's, that's one area where I think the temporality of our lives is extremely important. And when we're living, as I think we are, in a culture that actually doesn't much prize the activity of learning, you know, we like things to be delivered in tidy packages immediately. We like, we like our knowledge to come in an Amazon package, if you like. We, do, we don't want to spend the time it takes to learn. This is quite a, a hard thing to suggest, but it's also something which tells us how to value our history, not uncritically, but nonetheless positively. It tells us that we may expect to move on, to learn more. It tells us, therefore, that our own immediate doubts and brick walls today may not be the last word, which again is a form of hopefulness. Mm -hmm. And so the eternity that Christians believe in is not so much a kind of abstract realm beyond it all as the bare fact of God's unchanging, self-committing to what's been made. That's eternity. That's what doesn't alter. That's the, what other religious traditions would call the unborn, what, that which doesn't come into being and doesn't fade away. What Buddhists talk about in terms of what you encounter in meditation, that eternal reality, which is neither abstract nor just time protracted forever, that simply says there is something which is impervious to the changes and uncertainties we live in. There is something which, in respect to us, is utterly to be relied on, and it is love. It is committed love. So the doctrine of God's eternity is actually good news. It's not just a speculative philosophical point. It's an aspect of the gospel. Um, or indeed, the, um, the Jewish sense of God, because we read in it's Malachi, isn't it? I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, children of Israel, are not consumed. It's because I don't change, says God, 
that you don't fall apart. Yeah. Hmm. So just to follow up on that, so what about this idea then of eternal heaven and eternal hell? I mean, it, it sounds beautiful when we say that God is like this eternal love, but that that sounds amazing. But then, then when someone says, okay, there's a judgment and then there's an eternal heaven or an eternal hell, and imagine being eternal hell, like that sounds terrible. So how do we like, <laughs> how do we that? You know? It's not, not an easy question again to answer, but I'd say something like this. In our time-bound lives here and now, we are, we hope, learning something about God, and not something abstract, but something about how we live in such a way that we are in tune with God. We are, in some sense, sharing the, what should I say, the wavelength, the frequency of divine life. Um, in Christian terms, again, we are sharing the prayer of Christ to the Father, which is the eternal reality of the Holy Trinity. Um, and that's, that's a very ambitious thing to, to believe and to be confident of, but I think that is the heart of, of our faith. In, in the Spirit, we share Christ's relation to the eternal source of everything. And so we seek to live in such a way that that um, harmonic relationship remains. Now, heaven, I think, would be that state of affairs in which we were, I feel like, rooted and grounded, consolidated in that harmonious relation with God, the Holy Trinity. Um, and again, we're not talking about a, an immeasurable extension of time. We're talking about being in a state where, in some sense, we know that as St. Paul says in Romans, nothing can fracture that relationship, that attunement. So what then do we mean by hell? And I suppose what I understand by hell is what results if I've led a life which constantly puts me out of tune with that unchanging eternal reality? What if I have made myself so tone deaf that I cannot sing in tune with that, that melody. Now, I don't know, and nobody can know, whether anybody is so terminally, drastically tone deaf that even in a kind of endless perspective, they could never be, they could never learn the tune. Mm -hmm. I like to think, and I pray that this is the case, that all of us are in some sense capable of, of learning that even though um, it, may, it may not be rapid, it may not be automatic and easy. But I would hope and pray that at the end of all things, when the world collapses into its final, or the universe collapses into its final form, um, it, will, it will be possible for people to still to learn to love the God from whom they come. But who knows? Um, we look at, I look at my own life, we look at our lives and think, I'm, I'm capable of getting it so wrong that perhaps I can so distort and disable myself that I make myself daily more unable to hear the, the music. Hmm. Um, so day by day, I have to make sure that I've got some disciplines that put me back in touch with it. Question, does hope in your understanding, rest on an idea of eternity. And for those who cannot believe in this, where is hope to be found? Is there any way in which looking beyond time, perhaps to an afterlife, can do more harm than good? I, say, I think if talking about an afterlife means either that we think of a deferred happy ending for everybody or a deferred responsibility, you know, oh, it's going to be, all right, in the end, so I needn't worry about the suffering and the, the pain now, or it's going to be all right in the end and I have, I'll have plenty of time to sort it out. I can see that those views of an afterlife are, are fatuous, really, from a, a religious point of view. And what is so interesting in so many religious traditions is the emphasis on, if you like, finding eternity in the present moment. In this present moment of decision, relationship, 
a shaping of my life, the direction, and to use the word again, attunement of my life in this present moment, am I or am I not trying to adjust to something that utterly doesn't depend on me and doesn't depend on the passage of time? So eternity in the present moment is, if you like, what, what really matters. Is there a reality that does not alter? Um, and if there's a reality that doesn't alter, then it's not unreasonable to think that on the far side of death, the relationship with that reality is not destroyed. And that's a, a sound hope which Christians share. And that's not about deferring it till an afterlife, but saying the eternity that I now touch in my attempt to be open and faithful today, that eternity, if you like, holds me in being beyond time. Now, if you don't share that view, where does hope come from? And this is an interesting question, I think, because we, we're going into one of those periods, and I think this goes in waves in human history, we're going into one of those periods when we're much less optimistic about where the human race is going, for perfectly good reasons. We face, above all, the monumental environmental catastrophe that we have brought upon ourselves. And it's quite difficult to be optimistic about that, however hopeful we might be. We're also, I think, going into one of those periods where the notion of steady social and political progress looks a bit hollow, as we see tyranny and falsehood and totalitarianism resurgent all over the world when countries that have been democratic dip into a kind of um, authoritarian darkness again. So it's not looking brilliant out there. Um, what do you then hope for? You can go on hoping in something called human nature. Um, and I scratch my head a little bit as to what the content of that really is. You can tell good stories and share good stories and say, well, it doesn't have to be like this. That's good. But I think there's still that, that difficulty as to where the resources are beyond ourselves that we might look to. The what I've called the unborn, the unchanging, which says to us, even if there's failure today, that failure is not final because the eternal remains. And quite often you find people who don't have anything like a formal religious belief, speaking and acting as if they believed there were resources more than ourselves and more than the present moment. And they may not have a name for that, and they may not have a theory for that, but um, that's fine. You know, <laughs> they, have, they have touched something and recognized something. And I think we as religious believers do have, do have words for it. And I don't want to rush people into convictions they, they're not ready for. But I am struck by the way in which the sense that there is perhaps more resource in the world around us and the universe around us than we can quite compass or understand. That's something a surprising number of people would, I guess, give some adherence to. So trying to, I guess, draw on the, the, the resources that uh, human beings have for kind of uh, wrestling with this, you know, the source of these, um, uh, you know, additional resources that are beyond kind of human can. Um, can creation narratives, myths, um, science, and history be integrated into a symbolic rather than a literal formulation? Um, for example, it is said that God created the earth in six days, but uh, contemporary science is indicating otherwise. How can we understand religious temporality today in light of um, you know, um, current science? To me, the, the supposed conflict between science and religion is the ultimate phony war. I think it's it's a completely false standoff of, of views, not because um, science gives us the facts and theology gives us the meanings, but that science itself is a discipline which involves imagination, projection, risky guesswork, metaphor, and all the things that make human language and human thinking exciting. Science is exciting not because it's certain, but because it's constantly improvising and renewing itself. Uh, and I think there's a real alliance between the creative scientific mind and the poetic mind and the theological mind, that we ought to see these as coming together. 
Um, so I don't think there's, there's any deep conflict there. Even if science predicts, as it does, the heat death of the universe, everything collapsing back into, into stasis, if you like, nonetheless, the scientist will still sign the petition for the release of a political prisoner. The scientist will still educate their children. The scientist will still behave as if tomorrow matters because tomorrow there'll be human beings. And every tomorrow in which there will be human beings is the tomorrow we work for. Mm -hmm. So the, the long-term prediction doesn't erase that short-term sense, I am answerable today and tomorrow. So I don't see that there's an impossible tensional conflict involved here. I see any number of real possibilities for theologians and scientists to talk to one another, not about you know, who's right about the creation story, where again we've fallen into a into a trap of supposing that a, a manifestly poetic liturgical text like Genesis one is meant to be a kind of photographic record. So not about that, but about how scientists and theologians understand the nature of knowledge, the nature of speech, the nature of the mind, how we, how we map the world, how we understand our bodiliness. So much to talk about there, and so much of real creativity, I'd say. In your book, Candles in the Dark, Faith, Hope and Love in a Time of Pandemic, you offer beautiful meditations and thoughts that uplift the spirit in seemingly unprecedented times. Where do you, where do you your where does your hope and inspiration come from? So you mentioned earlier you have like daily practices that keep you. What are like where does it all come from? Well, in a rather boringly old-fashioned way, I I say morning and evening prayer. Um, I have a daily practice of silent meditation because I think that is one of the main ways in which we we find some sort of attunement and openness to God, where the preoccupations that we usually bring around our success and our impact and our reputation and our status just have to be parked. If you're sitting in silence, there is absolutely nothing you can do to impress anybody, not even God. And when you're stuck in a situation where you cannot impress anybody, Okay, there's a little bit of panic because we love to impress people and we think that's the way to survive. But what if you're just stuck where you really can't do it? Then either you go completely round the bend or you find a way of opening yourself up to what is there and to be aware in that moment of your body and your breath and to hold yourself physically still without tension, without um, sort of furrowing the brow and clenching the fists. But to hold yourself there and say, I am held by more than myself. I am I'm a place where, if you like, the, the water in the depth of the well here receives the water falling from the sky above. And you, you sit there like, like the well, if you like, waiting for the, the rain to fall. Um, th those are moments where you you are anchored freshly in hope, not in the sense of, oh, now I know what to look forward to, to tomorrow, but saying, now I know that this universe is not a place where I have any right to despair because it is not abandoned, I am not abandoned. The water in the well is there, the rain still falls. So those practices of silence, awareness, recognition of where I stand and where I sit, moments where the fuss and fret have to be put away. Those are the moments where hope grows. And if those moments are surrounded in the liturgy of morning and evening prayer, with going back to stories, the Psalms, the gospel, etc., then that sort of fills it out, that builds a little structure around it to say, well, I'm, I'm doing this because those are the stories 
that convince and hold me and show me that all this is, is worth doing day by day. But you've done so much in such a, not that massive amount of time. How, <laughs> how is that possible? Well, you're asking the wrong person, really. I, I don't know. Um, there's a poem by Hilaire Belloc about the water beetle. It says, he glides upon the water's face with ease, celerity, and grace. But if you try to make him think of how he did it, he would sink. <laughs> um, well, I, I sort of understand that. And I, I don't know. I, I've always been in jobs that have been quite demanding that have sort of rushed me from one thing and one person to the other. And if you live that sort of life, I think it's all the more important to try and make sure that you have some practices that allow you to, to focus on the job you've got to do and the person you're actually with. We all know how awful it is when you're with somebody who's surreptitiously checking the time and wondering how soon they can get away. And... Well, I'm, I'm not immune from that, I have to say. But you have to find ways of being present in what you do. And perhaps that, that helps a bit in getting a bit more done rather than um, you know, a half hour in which the first 10 minutes are spent thinking, oh my God, I've got such a lot to do. Um, the next 10 minutes are spent trying to do something. And the next 10 minutes are spent thinking, Okay, I've done that, but how on earth am I going to do the next thing? <laughs> Somehow you've got to push those you know, the bits of the sandwich, but press in outwards and say, well, yeah, let's try and reduce those preliminary and posterior worrying times a little bit. Do you have any particular way that you do that? I, I wish I knew, um, because, of course, I'm, I'm as prone as anybody to, to that, that temptation. Um, but sometimes the absolutely elementary bog standard things like making a list and crossing things off, I get great satisfaction from making lists and crossing things off. Uh, you know, these, these simple things do help, but I suppose above all, it's, it's trying to get into a, a state of mind where you say what comes to you in terms of demand and request is always going to be both a gift and an invitation. This is the person God's given you for this time. This is the task God's given you for this time. Just start by saying thank you and working with that. I wish I could do it better. <laughs> So um, the, the final question, um, do, you, do, you have an, uh, do you have a piece of scripture or literature uh, to share with us that you uh, personally find particularly helpful in uncertain or troubling times? Sometimes when I've been asked, have I got a favorite book of the Bible, um, which is a pretretty silly question, actually, but you know it does get asked, I would, I think, go for... 2 Corinthians as my, my book of choice, because I think 2 Corinthians is very much about, about what's the, it's the voice of a man who is pressed and confined by all kinds of opposition, uncertainty, undermining, and all the rest of it. And all those early chapters with the imagery about having treasure in earthen pots and so forth, and how we're all being changed into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory. I, I love those chapters because they're about the, the basic tension between the, the earthiness and the fragility of who we are and, and the glory of what we are privileged to be part of and to be drawn into. So certainly that's my scriptural focus. If I had to go for a piece of literature, um, I would, without hesitation, go to George Herbert's poem, Love. Mm -hmm. Love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back, mm -hmm. um, which is all about the completely unchanging, completely unreserved welcome 
that we are given by the holy reality that surrounds us and from which we come. Will you recite the poem for us? Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grown slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful. Ah, oh, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, said Love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, said Love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. I'm very privileged.